morning again. As most of you know, Reverend Roberta is uh, visiting her daughter in Seattle, and if you've been watching Facebook, they seem to be having a wonderful time. So I would ask continued prayers for Roberta and her daughter that they can enjoy this time together. I do have a couple of, of other um, prayer concerns that haven't made it on. Um, Jay Gossett, who is a cousin of a cousin, had a stroke this week, so if you could keep him in your prayers. And Bishop Trimble's mother also had a stroke, and that was a couple of weeks ago. She's 92, though, I believe, so hers is a little more of a concern because of other health issues. So if you could keep both of them in your prayers as well. And I'm kind of looking around. Do we have anything of any of the prayer requests that we've got listed or anything new that we need to add? All right, if you'll join me in prayer, we'll raise these and any concerns that you have on your heart up to the Lord. God, you've heard our prayers and our concerns. You know what weighs heavy on our hearts. Please lift up all of those that we've mentioned today and all of those that we don't even know about who are in pain or who are suffering. And we thank you for all of the blessings that you've given us, for all of the wonder in our world and all of the love that you've shown us, particularly for your son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're reading today from Acts, second chapter, second chapter, verses 1 through 21. Seven weeks had gone by since Jesus' death and resurrection, and the day of Pentecost had now arrived. As the believers met together that day, suddenly there was a sound like a roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames of t or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in languages they didn't know, for the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Many godly Jews were in Jerusalem that day for the religious celebrations, having arrived from many nations. And when they heard the roaring in the sky above the house, Crowds came running to see what it was all about and were stunned to hear their own languages being spoken by the disciples. How can this be, they exclaimed, for these men are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking all the native languages of the lands where we were born. <laughs> Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, men from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia Minor, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and Kyrene language areas of Libya. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and Jewish converts, Cretans and Arabians, and we all hear these men telling in our own languages about the mighty miracles of God. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they ask each other, but others in the crowd were marking. They're drunk, that's all, they said. Then Peter stepped forward with 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen, all of you, visitors and residents of Jerusalem alike, some of you are saying these men are drunk. It isn't true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk by 9 a.m. No, what you see this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And 
for, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. <clears throat> yes, the Holy Spirit shall come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they shall prophesy. And I will cause strange demonstrations in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun shall turn black and the moon blood red before that awesome day of the Lord arrives. But anyone who asks for mercy from the Lord shall have it and shall be saved. Today we're going to talk about Pentecost because today is Pentecost Sunday. And I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people shy away from celebrating Pentecost. I think in their minds they hear speaking in tongues and they see people rolling around on the ground and, and they're uncomfortable with that. And I'll be honest, I've been in church services where people spoke in tongues, and I was uncomfortable with that. And partly, I was confused by it, because it's like, I'm not sure what good it does to be talking in a tongue that nobody can understand. And that's the crux for me, because I don't think Pentecost is about making the word more mysterious. I think Pentecost is about making the word more understandable. From my point of view, what we do, how we say, the words we use are critical in telling the story. Now, most of you know I'm the lay leader of, the, of this church. That's why you're stuck listening to me today, because Roberta's off on vacation. But for my day job, I'm the president of the United Methodist Foundation of Indiana, and I do a lot of work in the investing world. So if I were to talk about, oh, I don't know, sustainable investing basis points, um, any number of investment terms, some of those you might understand, some you might not. If Ben Ellsbury was here, he'd be right there with me. He'd understand all those things. But some of you wouldn't. Things that you would understand, return on investment, ROI, a lot of you have heard about that. But I'm guessing if we were talking about, say, maybe the low carbon economy and investments in that, or if we were talking about small, mid, large caps, I probably have lost some of you. That's information that I've understood, that I know, that people who are familiar with it understand. But for a lot of you, it's just gibberish. I'm also CPA, and I'm admittedly a CPA geek. So when I reference something like GAP or GAS, any of my CPA friends would be shaking their head. Yeah, they, they know what that is. Not one of them would be checking their pants to make sure that their pants weren't gapping or worried about that I accuse them of passing GAS because they know what those terms mean. GAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. GAS stands for Generally Accepted Auditing Standards. So now you all know what GAP and GAS stand for, right? Well, let me show you something. This is an old book. All 1,300 pages of this book is the GAP guide. 1,300 pages. So when I say GAP to my accounting friends, this is what they think about. They think about revenue recognition, they think about property depreciation, they think about leaseholds. There are millions of concepts tucked into that one little word, gap. And when I reference it, they all understand what I'm talking about. I'm guessing a few of you probably don't, and more often don't care what I'm talking about. I've experienced that on the other end. My son, he'll talk about his wildlife biology things, and sometimes he gets technical. 
particularly when he and my husband start talking about the machinery and this goes there and that goes there. Steve would be right there with them. I'm usually just shaking my head. When they stop and put it into simple terms, I can understand what they're talking about. But when they make it complicated, I kind of go, mm, okay, mm hmm I'm sure all of you have examples that you could either share with me that I wouldn't understand or where you've been in the other role. We have to understand that one word, one thought can express a multitude of ideas to us, but not necessarily to somebody else. We forget in the church when we're talking about some of our quote, simple concepts, things that we expect everyone to be able to do. The Lord's Prayer. Everybody knows the Lord's Prayer, right? No. And why would they? We take for granted that people understand what we understand. We take complex ideas and shove them into one word. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's easy to explain, isn't it? We just call it the Trinity and we're done. Those are concepts that I even know some really advanced theologians have a hard time wrapping their heads around. And we throw it out with one word and expect people to understand it. Let me, let me take you down a different road. If you don't think language... And when I'm talking about language here, I'm not talking about English and German, and I'm talking about the words we use, our language. And I'm guessing a lot of you in this room, and maybe some online, will be able to relate to this one. Let me give you a story. I saw this online. So this mom was texting out, and she texted out that um, Aunt Mary had passed away this morning with a stroke, LOL. So her daughter immediately responds back, Mom, why is that funny? Mom responds with, well, it's not funny. I love Mary. What are you talking about? And her daughter says, well, you know, LOL means laugh out loud. Well, Mom's response was, no, I sent that to everybody. I thought it meant lots of love. Try this one on. IDK about you, but TBH, trying to interpret text shorthand drives me nuts. How was your texting skills? IDK, I don't know. TBH, to be honest. So that translated, I don't know about you, but to be honest, trying to interpret text shorthand drives me nuts. LMK, WIT. Let me know what you think. I see why am I, I am O. This is just craziness. In case you missed it, in my opinion, this is craziness. <laughs> and last but not least, W Y L. Me to stop, R N. Would you like me to stop right now? <laughs> It doesn't make sense nine times out of ten when I'm reading these text things, and I'm guessing some of you are right there with me. Some of you probably knew a few of those. But you feel frustrated, don't you? When people are using these things and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. It's not real. So why do I care? And yet we try to take Christian concepts and put them into words that people don't understand and they think, this doesn't make any sense. And it's not real to me, so why do I care? We have to think about how we share the good news with others and use a language that they're familiar with. All too often we use church speak. What do I mean by that? Umcor, bishop. Trinity, walk to Emmaus. When we talk about the Pentecost, we need to share it in terms that people can understand. 
One of the basic tenets that Jesus teaches us is a difficult tenet. Love God first. Love your neighbors like yourself. Now, we all know wrapped in that package is, first of all, neighbors doesn't mean the guy that lives next door to you. Neighbors means everyone in the world. When we share this story, we have to share that we love everyone, whether they look like us, they think like us, they love like us, everyone. Because we are called to love like God loves. And God loves everyone. He loves me just as much as he loves you. And just as much as he loves the homeless man on the street or the police officer or the criminal. He loves everyone. And that is a complicated concept to share. We also truly need to understand the Bible. When I talked about GAP, I could refer to these things because I've studied this for several years. And I've put it into practice. So when we talk about the Bible, we talk about Christianity, we need to have taken the time to study it, to understand it, to be able to tell that story. How do we share that God loved, and not only loved, but called him his beloved, a man who authorized the murder of another man, committed adultery with his wife, and had any number of other sins laid at his door. David is our beloved. We talk about him a lot. And yet he was truly a sinner. How does God love a sinner? Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. We need to understand the Bible. We need to understand God's presence in our life. We need to understand God's love well enough that we can explain it in simple terms. We have to explain complicated ideas, not the simple stories that we learned in Sunday school like Noah's Ark, but really hard things, which honestly, when you start thinking about it, Noah's Ark is pretty hard to explain. How do you explain to somebody who doesn't feel God's presence in their life, that he wiped out almost everyone and everything on the face of the earth. How do you explain that God sent his son to suffer and not just die, but suffer on our behalf? And more importantly, why? Why would he need to do that? Those are complicated issues. And there's things that we need to understand so that we can explain them in simple terms. Let me give you a little bit of a picture of this. When I was in college, on campus there was always this preacher and he stood on his box and he yelled at everybody that walked by. For the men, he would just yell, sinner, repent. For the women, he used a little more derogatory terms for most of us. And he yelled, repent, repent. The rapture is coming. Now, my personal opinion is I'm guessing that most of the people that heard him did not understand what he was talking about. Did not feel the presence of God in their life or the love of God reaching out to them. And I would almost be willing to bet that there was a fair percentage of them that looked at him and said, that's Christianity at its worst. That is the hypocrisy of Christianity. So how we communicate is as critical as what we communicate. Now, I've got one last thought that I want to share with you to add to this mix. Why is it that so often we as humans try to tear people down rather than to build them up. What do I mean by that? Well, towards the middle of these verses, when the people around the disciples saw this miracle, I mean, 
Fire was dancing on their heads, and suddenly they could speak in every language that was present. Did you see them go, wow, this is awesome. God is awesome. These disciples are great. No, they're drunk, obviously. All too often, that's what I see. When I see people who are on fire for God, there's somebody that's going to be trying to tear them down. You hear things like, oh, well, they just think they're better than everybody else. Or, eh, they just want everybody to look at them. They want to be the center of attention. Sometimes, those are the nice things that are said about them. Instead of celebrating when someone else is in ministry that changes lives, people cast stones. Clearly, they were drunk. Couldn't have been a miracle of God that they saw. And think about this just a minute. Not only were they casting stones at the disciples, but the disciples had to stop what they were doing and deal with this. They had to change their direction, their focus, and their energy to refute the claim that they were drunk. So those people who are busy doing ministry, when you try to tear them down, they've got to stop doing the life-changing ministry that they're doing to deal with this complication. Now, I'm going to give you an example. I don't participate in the community meal. If I do, it's only to buy food. And I could say, you know, like, well, you know, it's not a big deal. They only feed a few people. It's the same people. Or I could say, this is an awesome ministry. It changes lives both in our congregation and in our community. I just haven't carved out the time to participate in it. That's okay. Not every ministry is for every person. Not, what's not okay is for me to say something bad about it because it's not my ministry. Live nativity. Now that one's one I really do participate in. I love the live nativity. Partly because I've been out front and I've listened to people come up and ask me, is that baby a boy or a girl? And I'm not talking about little kids. I'm talking about adults that don't know the story of Jesus. I have the opportunity to share that. That's life-changing for them. Now, if it's not part of your ministry, you could say, well, gee, it's only a one-time thing. Who cares? But there's no reason to. It's not an either or or. We should be supportive of those who are telling the story. We should listen to theirs and share ours. There are amazing ministries going on in our congregation. There's amazing stories to tell. How we say it, the words we use to describe it, what we say, those words matter. We can turn people off in a heartbeat. Or what we say, the words we use, can inspire people and excite them to learn more and to join in our wonderful community of believers. So think about this next week. How your words are impacting those people that you meet. Are they kind? Are they building up? Are they tearing down? Do they understand what you're saying? Or are you kind of making it so complicated that they didn't care? Join me in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray you direct our words and our actions that others we meet in the next week can feel your love and your presence and hear your truth. Bring us together again next week that we can celebrate your presence in our lives together and listen to your words. In your son's name we pray. Amen.